Well, good morning. It's great to see you for worship today. I'm excited about what the Lord will do in our midst as we proclaim him king and as we give him the honor and the recognition and the worship that he so richly deserves. I want to invite you to stand with us this morning as we begin our service today. And I want to, I want to ask you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. And let's pray as he taught us to pray. Say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Are you ready to worship today? Come on, here we go. God bless you. You can have a seat.
Oh, great. It's wonderful to be together in worship today. We're glad you're here. I want to remind you that uh, our pastor has been away for the month of July on sabbatical, and that next Sunday he'll be returning to the pulpit here at Mabel White. So that's going to be a wonderful, a wonderful day. You know, Pastor Lee is such a wonderful preacher every Sunday. I'm, I'm eager to know what he's going to do at, when he's had an entire month to prepare. So this is going to be good. I wouldn't want to miss it if I were you. Today we're blessed to have our executive pastor, Glenn Cannett, bringing our message today. And so, uh, so glad, Glenn. And brother, you are looking clean today. Look at that. He is looking so sharp. He's got his little, his little pocket square there. I, I forgot mine today. But man, you're looking good, excited to what, about what the Lord is going to do in our midst today. A lot of folks are traveling around, going on vacation and all those things. But we're here, and the Lord is here today to meet with us. And I know that you're excited about what he will do uh, with us today. We are excited, if you are a guest, to have you. Uh, if you don't mind, take that yellow sheet in the back of the pew, fill it out. And then after the service, if you, if you would go back to the welcome desk, which is right out here, we have a special gift that we'd like to give you to say thanks for coming and uh, extend ourselves to you. Thank you for being here. Also, I want to uh, remind you of our buddy Jed Bays, who's here on the piano today from over in Columbus. Yeah. Jed is a wonderful young, uh, young man, young worship leader. His wife Emily is here. Uh, he'll be singing for us later in the service. And they're going to have some CDs out in, the, out in the lobby as you leave today. I know you're going to want to stop by and say hello and check that out as well. So a lot of great things are going on today. If, if, um, and so right now, if uh, you would all stand together, we want to be sure everyone feels welcome and loved in the house. So turn around and shake hands and say hello. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence here. We lift our voices and our hearts and we lift our hands unto you. Amen.
I just want to remind you guys that this is the last Sunday uh, that we're collecting school supplies for our Love Loud emphasis for this, this past, past month so that we can reach out to the community and uh, bless some, some needy children with school supplies, needy schools with supplies. And so I want to remind you of that. And as well as you give this morning, it opens the door for opportunities for us to minister to the church and to, to outside opportunities. I think about next Sunday is Promotion Sunday, and I think about the new group of seventh graders I'm getting. I'm having a luncheon for them after, after church today up in the loft, and so I'm excited about that. But when you give, you open opportunities for people like PJ and Janice and myself in the adult areas to reach out and to build relationships with people and with families so that we can reach them with the gospel, so we can encourage them in the faith. And so I just want to thank you as you're giving this morning and, and just remind you that you're giving to a ministry and you're helping us partner uh, with, with families and to reach them with the gospel. So let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are, God. We thank you that as a church and as a body of believers, we have the opportunity to reach out through various, various giving, various uh, opportunities, various ministries to, to reach families, to impact families with the gospel, and to see lives changed and lives turned to you. God, I thank you for this, the, the offering this morning and just ask that you would bless it. God, that your hand will be on it. God, and that you would bless those who are faithful in giving. In your name we pray. Amen.
know that chorus, won't you sing it with me? We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's give him a hand. I think I can do okay after that. <laughs> fantastic job this morning leading us. Thank you for being here. Our musicians, choir and orchestra, Scott, they did a fantastic job, didn't they, this morning? Amen. I tell you, and the one on the keyboard, that's the best one to me. <laughs> and uh, I'm a little partial, a little partial, but um, take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Well, here we are, August 2015. A couple of things are ahead of us as a church. Over the next few weeks, Rob already alluded to this, the school year is going to begin for many. Some of you have to start this week. I know you can't wait, right? The new school year is going to begin, and, and next Sunday as a church, promotion Sunday, and, and, and when you become an adult, no longer do you promote up to your grade in church like you did when you were a kid, but you move up a grade. And all our kids are going to move up next week. As they move up a grade in school, they're going to move up to their new class. Next Sunday... Scott already mentioned our pastors are going to return from a sabbatical, refreshed, refocused, ready to lead us. A couple things ahead of us, and as we approach it, as we approach those things, the days ahead. This morning, I want us to see what does God have to say to us as Mabel White Baptist Church as we approach those days, as we enter into August. Here we are. What does God have to say to us as we read His Word today? Paul, while he was conducting his ministry on earth while, they, while he lived his life. He established the church in Corinth, the city of Corinth. And he ministered there for about two years there at the church in Corinth. He left them and then he went to Ephesus. While he was in Ephesus, he wrote his first letter to the Corinthians. The purpose of the first letter that he wrote, there were some problems in the church. Surprise. There were some divisions in the church at Ephesus, uh, Ephesus excuse me, at Corinth. And as he was in Ephesus, he wrote to him, and he wrote to address some of the scandals and some of the immoralities and, and some of the things that were creeping into the church from the ungodly lifestyles on the outside. This is exactly what the church at Corinth needed, as Paul wrote. However, after Paul wrote his first letter, we have this problem in the church sometimes, don't we? We get correction. We don't always fix it. So Paul continued to, to notice that there was this group that while Paul was in Corinth, gave Paul some problems. You're not teaching the true gospel. The things you're sharing, that's not the gospel. There were these Judaizers, and they apparently were opposing Paul's teaching, and, and they followed Paul around to everywhere he went, and they said that Paul's not teaching and preaching the truth. The things he's sharing aren't the truth. What we have is the truth. And basically what they're presenting as the Judaizers is this blend of, of Judaism and, and Christianity. And they were basically insisting that when people came to Christ, they still had to observe the law of, law of Moses. That's not what Scripture teaches. So Paul said, uh uh They said that the things that, that Paul was preaching about the grace of God, those are not accurate. What he's teaching isn't the authentic gospel. 
People had to be circumcised. People had to do other things, other particulars of the law in order to be a Christian. The, the Judaizers, they called themselves the Christ Party. They claimed that we're the true followers of God. You need to follow us and our teaching. So Paul, what does he do? No. He wrote him a second letter, a second letter to the Corinthian church. He addresses the Judaizers and their teaching, and he says, I've got some things to share with you. And as Paul closes his second letter to the Corinthians, as we read it this morning, he shares some concern not only about the teaching that, that this group is promoting and that they're embracing, but I've got some concern about the things you're doing. And so he challenges them to gain a better understanding of what true fellowship with God is. Look at 2 Corinthians with me this morning. We're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21. And we're going to read through chapter 13, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 21. Paul writes, he says, I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you, and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity, the immorality, and the sensuality which they have practiced. Notice chapter 13, verse 1. This is the third time I am coming to you. Every fact is to, is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have previously said that, that when present the second time, and though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past, and all the rest as well, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Since you are, are seeking for proof of the Christ that speaks, who speaks in me, and who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. For indeed, he was crucified because of weakness. Yet he lives because of the power of God. For we are also weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed toward you. Notice verse 5. Test yourselves, speaking to the church at Corinth, speaking to the church at Mabel White this morning, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. Jesus, thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that as we've read it, that you've spoken to us. God, as we examine it, speak to us even more. Show us as your church how we can apply it, how we can do it. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Notice what Paul did as he opposed those, or as he addressed those that opposed his ministry. Listen again to what he told the Corinthians here. Notice verses 3 through 5. Paul writes and he says, Since you are seeking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me, and who is not weak towards you but mighty in you, for indeed he was crucified because of weakness, yet he lived because of the power of God. For we also are weak in him, Yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed towards you. Notice verse 5. This is the foundation that I want us to move forward with this morning. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ in you, is in you. Unless you indeed, unless indeed you fail the test. So Paul here, addressing the problems that were going on in court the ungodliness, the immorality. He puts the focus on the church. And what did he insist? He said, you need to examine yourself in light of what I share with you. Instead of putting the focus on Paul, yeah, Paul defended himself. He didn't say, I'm going to put the focus on me. No, what did he do? He put the focus on them. And, and when they examine their own lives, they'll recognize is indeed Christ in them. A self-examination here was going to prove if they were in the faith. And, it, and basically it's going to reveal if, if Christ was Lord of their life, if, if they were walking in obedience to him. They need to, needed to examine themselves. And then they would see what? If they passed the test. Scandals. Immoralities. Much of what was happening in the city of Corinth then is happening in America today. 
prevalent. And many people claim, I know God. I follow God. But the, as Paul mentioned here, he says, when people are examined, it's going to become obvious if they know God, whether or not they know him personally. As we call ourselves a Christian in August of 2015, is there evidence that we are in the faith? Do our lives prove that we're a Christian? As Paul said, as we just read, Paul says it's our duty as Christians to do what? Examine ourselves. Examine our spiritual state. Well, how can we do that? If we're supposed to do it, how do we do it? How can we evaluate our lives as Christians? How can we, how can we test ourselves, as Paul says here? Well, this morning, I want you to take notes. And I'm going to try to move fast. Some of you say, yeah, you won't have no problem with that. But I'm going to give you nine questions for a self-examination. As we talk about examining ourselves as the church, as we talk about the days ahead, let's examine ourselves. Here's our first question this morning. Let's all ask ourselves this question as we look at these nine. Let's start with this one. Do I read the Bible daily? On a daily basis, do you read more blogs? Do you read more books? Do you read more newspapers? Do you read more of everything else but the Word of God? What bloggers and authors and reporters, yeah, they may have some good stuff to say, but it's nothing compared to the Word of God. Scripture tells us we're to read it, we're to study it, we're to memorize it. God's Word should be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. God's Word should guide and direct every aspect of our life. <clears throat> this God-breathed book, God-breathed book, should be our guide for everyday living as we examine ourselves. As we ask ourselves this morning, do I read the Bible daily? Not only that, here's another question. Question number two. Do I pray daily? Most of the time, how do we pray? We pray more reactively, don't we, than proactively. We pray when we face something we can't handle. God, help me! We only pray when we have to most of the time, don't we? When we pray more reactively than proactively, we miss the point of being in a relationship with God. The Bible tells us, pray without ceasing. Now, obviously, we're not to walk around with our heads bowed and, and our eyes closed all day long. And Paul isn't referring necessarily to nonstop talking, but he's referring to an attitude of God consciousness, an attitude of surrender, God's surrender that we have all the time in our lives. Paul told the Ephesian Christians to, to see prayer as a spiritual weapon, to use it when you fight spiritual battles. Prayer should be our first response to every fearful situation. It should be our first response to, to every anxious thought, to every task that we face. Paul taught the believers of Colossae to, to devote themselves to prayer, to keep alert in it. Every single waking moment of our lives is to be lived with an awareness that, that God is with us and that he is involved in our thoughts and actions. A lack of prayer, what does it, what does it cause? It causes us to depend on ourselves more than we depend on God. Unceasing prayer is continual dependence upon God. We're also supposed to pray for those in authority, Scripture teaches us. We should pray for our pastor. We should pray for our church leaders, especially as school is beginning. We should pray for our school officials. We should pray for our bosses. Why'd you have to mention them, Glenn? We should pray for our mayors. We should pray for our governors, even our president. Especially in light of this election year, prayer is even more important. Here at Mabel White Baptist Church, we have as a church three opportunities corporately to pray together. 
every Sunday. My dad's sitting here this morning, and he'll tell you, my mom will tell you, Glenn's not a morning person. Our men gather at 8.15 every Sunday morning. There's no reason every single man that belongs to this church shouldn't be there. If this guy can get up and be there, you can too. Every Sunday morning, 8.15, 106, we gather for prayer. Men, you ought to be there. At 8.30, we have a co-ed group. Our prayer team prays for our pastor and prays for the day ahead here on Sunday, every Sunday, at 8.30 in the conference room. Take part in that. This Tuesday, Mike Odom came to me before the service. He said, hey, I don't know who's making an announcement, so I want to give you an announcement. I said, it's in my sermon. You don't have to worry about it. But the first Tuesday of every month at noon, here in the worship center, we have prayer with the pastor. And if you're in the area, come. If you can only stay 15, 20 minutes, come. We pray here at the first Tuesday of every month at noon. So if today is August 2nd, what is this Tuesday? It's the first Tuesday. Join us at noon in here as our pastor leads us in prayer. If he's out, one of our staff will lead it. But those are just three opportunities that, that we as a church corporately pray, pray together. Every single life group at Mabel White ought to have a prayer leader. Teachers, if you don't have a prayer leader in your group, you need one. Larger groups have more than one. Prayer needs to, it needs to be in our DNA as a church. For Christians and for the church, you know what prayer ought to be like for us? It ought to be like breathing. Do I pray daily? It's a good question for examination, isn't it? For self-examination. Here's our third question this morning. I promise I'm going to move fast. Number three. As we do this examination, here's a question. Do I attend church regularly? Church attendance in America is on the decline. Now we know that the number of Christians in the United States is decreasing, obviously, because of our nation is, is moving away from its roots, its Christian roots. However, one of the main reasons for decline in church attendance is that members attend less frequently than they did years ago. Years ago, active church members. This was an active church member years ago. An active church member, those that attended three times a week. Did you get that? Three times a week. That, years ago, that was an active church member. Today, many define an active church member. Listen to this. Somebody that attends church services or events at least three times a month. What? An active church member now has been redefined as a person that comes three times a month? Travel ball. Weekends at the lake. Family vacation. Those are all good things. They're not bad things, but sometimes we put them ahead of attending church. Unfortunately, for many Christians, all other activities have become mandatory. Attending church has become secondary. There you go, Glenn, being legalistic. I'm currently reading, and some of you in the church are reading it with me, Tom Rainer, the president of LifeWay. He wrote a new book called I Will. And he identifies the problem of church attendance in America in his book. I completely agree with him. As you read the book, you're going to see that the church attendance isn't about, I did it, put a check in my box. It isn't about a legalistic obligation. We don't need a checklist to be close to God. But regular church attendance, it shouldn't be one option among men. Christians should persistently and consistently attend church services and events. Do I need to ter attend church regularly? Do I need to attend church more regularly? Pretty good questions for examination, aren't they? Here's question number four. I told you I was moving quick. Do I share the gospel frequently? Jesus commanded us in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He says, go into all the world, Christian. Preach the gospel to all creation. The Great Commission is a global calling. Maybe God's calling you to go on a mission trip. Christians are commanded by God to actively share the gospel with the world. 
Personal evangelism, it's not just the role, yes, we should be doing it. It's not just the role of the pastor and the staff. Personal evangelism is for everybody. All Christians are instructed to be evangelists. Do you share the gospel regularly with your coworkers, with your neighbors, those you come into contact with? Do you even try to get to know them to share the gospel with them? Friend, personal evangelism is a command. It's not an option. It should be an intentional effort. We should regularly tell our story of how we came to a saving faith in Christ. Are you prepared to tell others how to share the gospel? Unfortunately, many in our church, they're not prepared to share. If you're unsure how to share, how to share the gospel, find me. Join us on Wednesday nights when we go do outreach. I'll help you. I'll help you learn how to develop your testimony and share the gospel with your testimony. This Tuesday, I went to lunch. You surprised? But I went to lunch by myself. Can you believe that? Nobody invited me to lunch on Tuesday. But I went down to the Mellow Mushroom. I went, actually went late because I was doing some things here, so I had a late lunch. Maybe that's why nobody invited me because I went late. But I'd encourage you to go to lunch at Mellow Mushroom. They have a great lunch special. Two slices of pizza, I think a drink, you get it for $5. So I was, I was doing some study. I took my sermon stuff with me. I went down to Mellow Mushroom and ordered a couple slices of pizza and, you know, by myself. And my server came over to the table. Did a great job. Got to know her, talk, talking with her. And I just said, hey, I'm Glenn. Uh, never seen you here before because usually I, try to get, I, I get to know most of the servers in the restaurants I go to. So I didn't want to say, yeah, he does. And I was talking with her, and I, you know, I said, hey, you know, I'm Glenn, and one of the pastors down the street at, at Mabel White, and, you know, uh, you know, I just want to see if you don't have church to go to, and, you know, uh, she goes, I know who you are. She goes, I met you before. I met you at Texas Roadhouse. I used to work there. <laughs> and I share that this morning to get a laugh, but look, I work with Christians. At least I think most of them are, right, Scott? I work with Christians. The people I'm, I work with spend most of my time with are Christians. So when I go to lunch, yeah, I'm going to eat, but those are the people that aren't in church that I meet sometimes. And so what I do is I try to get to know them, and I invite them to church. And, and we were joking this morning. Somebody said, who cut your hair? And, and I told them, and I was telling about a family in the church that the girl used to cut my hair when I moved here, and, and their whole family, the parents, everybody goes to church here now. But me and another lady in our church I'm looking at right now, and we invited her to church. Started coming to church. We go to the great gas station. We go to the grocery store. We go to get our hair cut. We go to restaurants. Yes, we're going there to do those things, but Christian, that is our mission field. Our neighborhood is our mission field. That's who we're to share the gospel with. Paul prayed for unbelievers to be saved, and we should be too. We need to ask God, God, help us. Give us a burden for lost people, people that don't know you personally. And then we need to be, befriend people that don't know them and share them. All we got to do is take a look around and see that our world's full of people that don't know Christ, isn't it? They're separated from God, and they're headed straight to hell. You know what Mabel White Baptist Church ought to be known as? Mabel White Baptist Church, this is what we should be known as. We should be known as an army. And we should be known as the army that infiltrates middle Georgia and, and the world with the gospel message. That is what we should be known as. Sharing the gospel should be so important to us that we can't keep it to ourselves. We need to be obedient. We need to become an everyday verbal witness for Christ as we examine ourselves this morning. Do I share the gospel frequently? Question number five, we're doing good. Do I serve the church faithfully? As we grow in our relationship with Christ, one of the things we should come to recognize is that, that God's equipped us and he's prepared us to serve him in a special way. The Bible tells us that as believers, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit in us and, 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 we're to, and the Holy Spirit empowers us to serve others on his behalf. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts and, and the Bible tells us that, that every believer has been endowed with spiritual gifts to use them for ministry. And 1 Peter 4.10 says, as, as each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So the Holy Spirit inside of us as a Christian is who empowers us, who equips us to serve Christ. Well, how do I determine my spiritual gifts? We're talking about that this morning, Glenn. Well, first of all, pray. Ask God, God, show me how you've gifted me for service. Also, get involved in a ministry, maybe. That, that naturally interests you. Give it a try. 
Maybe even take a spiritual gifts assessment. Let me know if you need some help with that. I'll help you do assessment to maybe as a starting point. But a gifts assessment is only one tool. Be aware of how maybe others may be affirming your ministry and say, you know, you, you need to be doing that. You, 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 you should be doing that. The easiest and quickest way to, to get started serving is by volunteering to serve. Starting your life group. In addition to helping life group function, there's many other ministry areas that need people to serve. In the Christmas season this year, how many people you want singing up there, Scott? A hundred. So, I don't know how many were up there today, but some of you sitting out there, you need to be up there singing. Where can you serve faithfully? If you need help in this area, don't don't hesitate to contact me, Scott, or any of our staff members to try to find you a place to, to serve. So, we examine ourselves, do we serve the church faithfully? It's a good question, isn't it? Question number six. Yes, we're going to talk about this morning, this this morning. Do I give to the church generously? Our budget should reflect a commitment to God's work. Do we handle the financial resources that, that God has given us correctly? As a starting point, the Bible teaches us, the Bible is very clear, that our starting point we're to tithe, give a tenth of our income to the church. The Bible says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and, and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. When we tithe, not only are we obeying God, but we're also saying, God, I trust you to meet my needs. I trust you to take care of me. You say, well, Glenn, I just can't do that. I just can't do it. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's been said you can tell a person's priorities by taking a look at their checkbook. It's true. Would your checkbook show that you prioritize God's kingdom? Do you tithe? Do you give to missions? When we collect items such as coats and blankets and flu food and school supplies, do you give? Friend, Christian, we should contribute of our financial means. Cheerfully. Too often we say, oh, I, do I have to give it? I don't want to give it. No, we should give cheerfully. We should give regularly. We should give liberally for the advancement of the gospel on earth. As we examine ourselves, we have to ask that question. As we test to see, are we in the faith? Are we living the faith? Are we being obedient? Do we give generously? Question number seven. If you're sitting here this morning and you're married, and you're married, here's a question. Does your marriage... Reflect the love that Jesus had for his church. Husbands, men, here's a question. Do you love your wife as Christ loved the church? Do you love her sacrificially to the point that you'd be willing to die for? Men, would your wife agree with your response? You say, yes, of course, Glenn. Would your wife agree? Okay, picked on the men long enough. Wives, are you subject to your husband in everything? Do you follow his leadership as to the Lord? Ladies, would your husband agree with your response? As we talk about our exa examining ourselves, especially in the marriage relationship, does your marriage reflect the love that Jesus had for his church? Question number eight. Spoke to the married couples, now I'm going to speak to the parents. If you're a parent, I've been one for a little over a couple of years now, and it's fun, and it's an experiment sometimes. But if you're a parent, here's a question. Are you raising your children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord? 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, Fathers, we're to bring up our children in discipline and instruction in the Lord. So our objective as parents sitting here this morning, as, as we think about becoming parents, we're to teach our kids to love God with all their hearts. We're to teach our kids to submit their thoughts and their deeds and their actions to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Parents, as we talk about these things more, are we teaching our kids to live and learn Scripture? Are we teaching them the importance of prayer? Are we teaching them to consistently attend church? Are we teaching them to, to faithfully serve? Are we teaching them to, to generously give? Are we teaching them to share the gospel? One of the things I do with Alistair, sometimes when I go visit people that visit the church, I'll take them with me. And, you know, there ain't anybody that's not going to open the door for that little boy. <laughs> they might look through the window in their door, look through the little hole and say, I ain't opening it for him, but if I got my son, what are they going to do? Somebody say, yeah, then we definitely open it for him. But what are we teaching our kids? Will we teach them God's plan for marriage and the family? Unfortunately, they're going to be taught the opposite of that everywhere they go now in America. Yes, parenting, it's often an experiment, isn't it? And we're going to mess up as parents. And we may even sometimes blow it. But if we aim at nothing, what's going to happen? We'll hit it every time. Are you raising your children, parents, in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord? Question number nine. As we examine ourselves this morning, as we test ourselves, as the Apostle Paul tells us. I heard an amen. If you're a child, you're sitting in here. When I say child, your parents are responsible for you. You're, you're a teenager. You still live at home. You're not out on your own. If, if you're a child, children, teenagers, Obeying your parents, it isn't an option, is it? It's a direct command from God, and, and it may be challenging. And my parents here this morning say, yeah, it was challenging for you. It may be challenging at times to do what your parents tell you to do and to obey and honor them. But there's a reason for that command in Scripture. God's desire is so that children learn to honor and obey their parents so they can do what? So one day they can grow up, and one day they can live wisely. Because what's going to happen in the workplace? We're going to have bosses. And what are those bosses going to tell us? Stuff to do. And we don't always like what they tell us to do. Guess what? We better do it or what's going to happen? That's why we learn, and, and, and children need to learn to obey. Kids, teenagers here this morning, sometimes your parents tell you, they tell you no, not because they don't want you to enjoy something, but because they made the same mistake you're about to make. And they don't want you to make that mistake. And they especially want you to learn about the ones that they don't have to tell you about. But as, as, as a child, as a teenager, when you, when, when you learn to, to obey your parents at home, what's going to happen? When you leave home, you're going to be able to, to respect authority and, and, and be able to do that. The Bible says throughout the book of Proverbs that the children that, that aren't disciplined or children that fail to obey their parents, they're much worse off in life. Proverbs teaches us that. And the only time really as a teenager or a child you should disobey your parents if, if it's against God's command here in this word. But children, are you obeying your parents in the Lord? As we examine ourselves this morning, as a child that your parent has responsibility for, are you obeying them in the Lord? Young Jesus, though he was the son of God, Jesus, we learn from Scripture in the book of Luke that he obeyed his parents. And as a result, he grew in earthly wisdom. So we have a beautiful example there. As we, as we do our self-examination this morning, children, teenagers, are you obeying your parents in the Lord? We went through a lot this morning, didn't we? A lot of questions. as we did our self-examination. 
how'd you do? What do you realize when you examine yourself? How are you doing? What are your eyes? What are your ears? What are your heart? What are your tongue? What do your feet reveal? Are we hearing God's word clearly? Are we doing what those words tell us? Are we keeping our eyes on the teaching that's going to guide us to righteousness? Are we protecting our heart from evil? Is our mouth clean and pure? Are we walking in God's truth without wavering? As you examine your life this morning, as we test ourselves, does our life reveal, reveal the, the work of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit? In the book of Galatians, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. What are the deeds of the flesh? Well, we know this. Immorality. Impurity. Sensuality. Drunkenness. Carousing. It's a pretty long list in Scripture. Are you sitting here this morning as you examine yourself? Is there sin in your life you're hiding as a Christian? Is there sin that is keeping you from being who God has called you to be? You need to repent of it. We don't need to allow the enemy to win. For too long in the church, he has. This morning, as you've examined your life, you may be just ready to quit. You say, well, gosh, I can't. I'm just ready to, to, to toss in the towel. Don't quit. Make a commitment. Take the steps needed to change. Take the steps needed to strengthen your walk. Well, God, it's time to say, I will. I will change. I will make a difference for the cause of Christ. That's what God wants us to do as a church. He wants us to impact this community and this world like never before for him. But we need to examine ourselves. God, is there anything in the way we need to get out of the way? Is there anything we're not doing that we should be doing? Is there anything we're doing we don't need to be doing? God, help us. Help us as we've tested ourselves this morning, as we've examined ourselves. Are we in the faith? Some of you sitting here this morning, you're sitting here and everything that I'm sharing with you is far. You don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never had a moment in your life where you know, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. And apart from that sin, I can't be with him forever. I believe God, yeah, he came to this earth, he lived a perfect life, sin life, so, so I could spend eternity in heaven one day. Some of you sitting here this morning, you don't know Christ personally. You need to make that decision today. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. As you've examined yourself, if you were to die today, do you know for certain that heaven will be your home? If you can't look back over your life and point to a place in your life, now you may not remember the specific date, but if you can't point back to a time and say, that's when I made a decision to follow Christ. You don't know Christ. There's got to be a time in your life where you admitted your sin, you place your belief in him, confess he's Lord, and give your life to him. If you haven't done that in a few moments, you're going to have that opportunity. We're going to have an invitation. We're going to sing. We're going to have counselors. And if you don't know Christ as your Lord, if you, if you, if you never made a decision to follow him, you'll, you can follow him today. Those of you sitting here this morning, you know Christ personally. These questions that we ask ourselves, we need to ask those every day, don't we? If we're honest. And you know what happens when we ask him, what do we see? When I went through him this week, 
you know, there's some things that I'm not doing that I need to be doing. You know, there's some things that I am doing, but I could do them better. We need to constantly examine ourselves so we can see it's Christ Lord of our life. You know, we come to church week in, week out, and we say, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. But then we leave, and we don't live for him. Christian, you may be sitting here today. There's some sin in your life you need to repent of. You can come to this altar when we sing and pray. You can talk to one of our counselors. What decision do you need to make today? As you've examined yourself to make things right with God, so you can be the Christian he wants you to be. So we can be the church he's called us to be. Until we can answer those questions the way he wants us to answer them, in obedience and according to his purposes and wills, we'll never be the church he wants us to be. Collectively as a body and individually. Jesus, thank you for your day. But I know this is a lot of information. It was a lot for me this week. God, thank you for every person that's here. Lord, thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the Apostle Paul dealt with much of the same stuff that when he walked this earth that we deal with. Lord, thank you that when people were wanting to, to come against him, they said, yeah, you need to take a look at yourself. God, I pray this morning that we would take a look at ourselves. Lord, that we would examine and test ourselves. Lord, as we looked at these questions, Lord, that thank you for convicting us, showing us what we need to change. God, I pray, Lord, that it wouldn't stop there. Lord, that we wouldn't just be convicted. Too often that's what happens. But, Lord, that we would be convicted and we would take action. Lord, that we would be obedient. Make the changes in our life that we need to make as Christians so we can be more like you. So we can make more of an impact for you in our world. Lord, that's why you have us here. Lord, that's my prayer for every Christian that's here. Thank you for your word. God, I pray for the person here that doesn't know you personally, God. They're here. The person that has never made a decision to follow you. God, I pray in a few moments as we sing. Lord, if they wouldn't be able to walk out of this building today before they make a decision to follow you. They would come forward and grab Bobby by the hand and say, you know, I'm not a Christian. I may have been church, in church my whole life, but as we look at this morning, I, I've never had a point in my life where I, I turned to Christ and entered a, a relationship with Him. God, I pray if that person sits here, that they'd be obedient as we sing and they wouldn't leave. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for our time together. As Scott sings, Lord, the altar's open. I pray we'd be obedient as a church. Lord, that we would make the changes we need to make in each of these areas that we've looked at as husbands, as wives, as parents, as children, as Christians that need to be praying, seeking you. They need to be studying about you, learning about you so we can be you. God, I pray that we would make the changes you want us to make. Lord, and as we enter the days ahead, as our pastor comes back, and as we enter this new time of the year, like never before, we'd be walking in you. Or we ask this in your name. Amen.
in the 